Hello, Pastor Jeff here. Thank you for your interest in the music ministry here at Calvary Baptist Church. So excited to see what God is doing here at the church and the stories I'm hearing about the uh, hearts that are being affected through the music and uh, really just looking forward to seeing how he wants to continue to grow us as a church in this area. Of course, there is no other topic in a church that is more controversial than music and um you know, there are as many opinions uh, in the church as there are people. So we really want to make sure that we're looking at this through the right lens. Uh, fortunately, God has not left us to navigate these waters alone. His word has a lot to say about music. So it's wise for us to, to look at God's word as the standard. And then as 2 Corinthians 10.5 encourages us, we, we submit ourselves uh, submit our opinions that are in opposition to the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Uh, so in our time today, um, we, we won't be taking uh, a, a lot of time in this video for an exhaustive study of everything that the Bible has to say about music, but I do want to be as thorough as possible so we're able to walk away with some clear foundational principles from the Word of God. Uh, because if we if we get this right, I believe it really opens us up for tremendous joy and unity while, on the other hand, avoiding the error of uh, falling into divisiveness, contentious debate, or worse. Um, you know, as Christians uh, who treasure a right understanding about who God is, it's important that we recognize how our beliefs reveal themselves in worship our theology or the the study or understanding of of god informs our doxology our expression of praise to god so therefore the the chief end of theology then is doxology if we truly understand who god is the only adequate response will be that we fall down in worship uh, to god now, for the purpose of this video, we're not going to spend a, a ton of time breaking down God's character. We're going to jump straight into music as a form of worship to him. But, you know, if you'd like to learn more about who God is, uh, A.W. Tozer's book, uh, The Attributes of God, is a, is a great place to start. Or, you know, if you prefer, Pastor Dan or I would be happy to sit down and discuss these things with you. Um, but the goal here, of course, is to be thorough yet concise. Uh, there are a ton of resources out there that you might find helpful in thinking through music as a form of worship. But a couple of uh, those that I, I found that are, have been particularly helpful are Worship Matters by uh, Bob Coughlin, this book here, and Doxology and Theology by Matt Boswell. Uh, so I encourage you to check those out. Uh, but one passage of scripture that is just packed with several imperatives commanded by God related to worship is Psalm 96, verses 1 through 3. The, the psalmist, psalmist writes this. He says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare the glory of Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous work among all the peoples. Now, as I said, this isn't the only verse in the Bible dealing with music. There are tons from cover to cover, and it is exceedingly dangerous to build a theology on one passage. So that is absolutely not the goal here. But in this particular passage, we find a great microcosm of some crucial perspectives that, uh, on, on music that Scripture gives us. It shapes our doxology, our theology, the worship leader, and even the mission of the church. It answers the, the who, what, when, and why, and where of music. So let's take a look at that passage a little bit more closely. Sing to the Lord. The emphasis should not be about us. While it can be appropriate at times to sing about our feelings about God as individuals, the thrust here should really be us singing to God about who he is and what he's done. We'll get into more of that. Uh, a new song. There are no commands in the Bible, interestingly, to sing an old song. And it's not that it's disobedient or, or wrong to sing old songs. It's just that 
apparently God doesn't need to remind us uh, to do so. Uh, we're going to gravitate to those old songs on our own because we, we know them. Uh, we have memories associated with them. We trust them. They're comfortable. Um, so, so he doesn't need to encourage us in that direction. In fact, he, he encourages us in several places. Uh, Psalm 33, 3, sing to the Lord a new song. Um, so in many places throughout scripture, we're, we're actually encouraged to sing about what God is doing now here in this time. All the earth, uh, the whole earth is called to sing praises to God, not just in the United States or Europe, the whole earth. And that means that music style is going to vary based on culture. For example, you, you would expect that songs written by Christians in Ghana um, would have a different style than a song written here in the United States. And that doesn't mean one is better or more holy or more spiritual simply because of the cultural style in which it's written. Um, so there, there should be a, a variety of, uh, of sty styles of music, um, you know, since the, the church expands far beyond our local context here. Sing to the Lord. It's worth noting that this is actually the third time we're reminded to sing to the Lord, which, you know, when you when you listen to a lot of the contemporary music, uh, Christian Christian music that's out there, uh, how much of that is really just focused on us? Um, and if it's focused on us, is it worship to God? I'm, I'm reminded of a, a song. I was at a, a worship service years ago, and uh, they were singing a song by. Uh, Crowder, um, how he loves us. And it goes on and on. Oh, how he loves us, how he loves us, how he loves us. And while that's true, yes, God does love us as exemplified in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Um, as we're, you're, you're sitting in a worship service and we're singing about how he loves us, it's all this way, right? It's all from God down to us as if God is singing to us, elevating us. That's not the purpose of worship. Fine song. I'm not saying that it's wrong to, 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 to like that song or even sing that song, but in the context of congregational worship, our worship should be vertical, us towards God. Um, so our worship, it, it should be God-centered. It, it It's important to note, many of the Psalms, we, we do find examples of the psalmist expressing his feelings about God and, and even lamenting his own personal situations and struggles. So it's not that it's unbiblical to sing songs that address these things. It's just that, again, the emphasis in worship should be God-focused, us giving worship to God. And yes, sometimes in response to the works that he's performed in our lives, and we'll get to that in a minute. Bless his name. We don't bless God the same way that he blesses us. When we are blessed by God, we're, we're helped, um, we're strengthened, we're made better off than we were before. But God is complete and he lacks nothing. He is, he's not helped or made better off. Instead, when we bless his name, it's an exclamation of gratitude, exaltation, adoration. So the songs that we sing then should be th songs of thanksgiving and exaltation and adoration. We're told to tell of his salvation from day to day. Here we're told what we should bless his name about, his salvation. And as in our preaching, there should be a gospel emphasis in our music. It should tell the truth about who God is. He's, he's holy and perfect. He lacks nothing. He's far above us in, in every way. And then tell the truth about who we are. We're lost and in bondage to sin and worthy of the wrath of God and unable to do anything to remedy our condition. The truth about who Jesus is and what he's done. He's the promised one. He's the Messiah, uh, the one who makes payment for our sins and provides the only way for us to be reconciled to God. And, of course, our response to this good news. Um, that this isn't just good to know. Um, it's not simply a, a belief in a set of facts. This good news, this gospel demands a response of faith and re repentance. And to be clear, um, you know, it's not that every song is going to focus on every aspect of God's salvation. 
It's one of the reasons that we, we sing more than one song. Um, but when you look at the library of songs that we sing, there should absolutely be a, a clear picture of the gospel. These songs should accurately tell of his salvation collectively from day to day. Clearly, this, is, this isn't this is just a call uh, to sing to the Lord on Sundays between you know 11.55 a.m. and 11.15 a.m. We're called to sing to the Lord day to day. And it's also one of the reasons that music has been used in church history to teach theology. I mean, songs have, the best songs have a way of getting stuck in our heads. Um, What a wonderful thing to be humming a song that contains the truth about God on a Tuesday that we sing at church on a Sunday. Um, We're to declare his glory among the nations Here, we're reminded of the call for all the earth to sing praises to God. But before they can sing praises to God, they need to know of him. In Romans 10, Paul asks, uh, how will they know if they haven't heard? The the, the declaration here has a missional focus. To declare is to announce in the same way that the gospel is good news. The call to declare means we're to tell of it. Uh, We don't just keep it to ourselves. In the King James Version, it actually reads, Declare his glory among the heathen. So just like our preaching, um, our music should be declarative. It should declare the glory of God personified in the, the finished work of Jesus Christ. His marvelous works. The Bible is full of accounts of the great acts that God has performed for his people. Over and over, um, the, the, the book of Psalms recounts the wonderful deeds that the Lord has accomplished. And when we speak of his marvelous works, we're, we're speaking of his absolute control over events, people, powers. Um, his marvelous works reveal his presence among his people and show the world that he is, in fact, the one true God. Psalm 19 uh, verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. And in Romans 1, 19 through 20, Paul writes, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they were without excuse. So it is right to point to God's creative order and handiwork, but among his most marvelous works is the act of redemption. I recently had a letter come across my desk I'd like to share with you. Uh, It says, there are several reasons for opposing it. One, it's too new. Two, it's often worldly, even blasphemous. The new Christian music is not as pleasant as the more established style because there are so many songs you can't learn them all. It puts too much emphasis on instrumental music rather than on godly lyrics. Um, The new music creates disturbances, making people act indecently and disorderly. The preceding generation got along without it. It's a money-making scheme, and some of these new music startups are lewd and loose. Strong opinions. And uh, it's funny, this letter was actually written uh, by a pastor in 1723, Um, attacking Isaac Watts. Now, Isaac Watts, of course, wrote songs like When I Surveyed the Wondrous Cross, Joy to the World, and a litany of of others. And and so it's just interesting that, you know, as long as there has been church and music, there have been worship wars, right? So uh, again, everybody has opinions on, on these things. And so when we take what we just discussed out of Psalm 96 and, and try to apply that in this context here in Kalkaska at Calvary Baptist Church, the it, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that our, our, our application or our philosophy of music aligns with Scripture. And so, therefore, in order to uh, kind of define this, um, we've developed a, a vision statement that uh, says, rooted in history, yet contextually relevant, we seek to magnify the greatness of God in Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, skillfully combining God's word with music. 
thereby motivating the gathered church to proclaim the gospel, to cherish God's presence, and to live for God's glory. So then if we believe these things, we will therefore value A, biblical accuracy. Music has a powerful way of connecting words to our hearts and our, our memories. Um, you know, many of the old hymns, in fact, were, were written in order to teach theology to those who couldn't read. So when we combine God's word with good music, it becomes embedded into our minds first and then by the grace of God into our hearts. B, the stylistic variety. Uh, at the end of Revelation, we see the kings of the earth bringing their, sp their splendor, the, the, the fruit of their culture uh, to the Lord as an act of, of worship. Um, this is what we should be doing now. If the church is made up of every race, tribe, and tongue, uh, then shouldn't our worship, including our music, reflect this? We should be doing music that is culturally honest to who we are, but we must also do music that reflects that the church is bigger than just our own narrow demographic. The church is multicultural and extends through all the ages and our, our music should reflect this. So we believe that the church, the capital C church, exists from um, every nation. It spans all of history and into eternity. And so if we're only focused on songs that are written in the past 10 or 20 years, and neglect songs that are written in previous generations, and we're really missing out on a treasure trove of theologically rich music that has stood the test of time. And then on the other hand, if we believe, like the pastor who wrote the letter uh, to Isaac Watts, uh, that the canon of music was closed sometime before 1723, apparently, uh, and that new music should be opposed, how can we be obedient to Scripture when we're called to sing a new song? Um, we were created in God's image. He created us to be creative. And in my opinion, which means about this much, um, the church uh, should, th those who actually have access to the, the throne of God through Christ, and we should be the most creative musicians in the world. We should be the ones shaping culture through our art. Um, that's another story. We won't get into all that. But the point is, is that we want to be humble on both sides. Right. On, on the one hand, we don't want to be so proud uh, to think that everything that came before in previous generations is obsolete and of no use. And then on the other hand, not so proud um, to think that our generation was the last generation to write God honoring music. C. Musical excellence. Romans 12 um, verses 3 through 6 gives us fundamental truths about the gifts God gives us and how we're to, to use them and, and view them. Um, it provides us uh, with biblical principles that can really help us manage a growing te team of musicians. We're reminded in, in this passage that uh, we're not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought, right? But to think of ourselves with sober judgment. It tells us that the members um, do not all have the same function, that we are one, uh, that, that, that we're one body in Christ, and that we're individually members of one another, and that we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. So then in light, in line of those true with those truths, we, we, we don't have to apologize for using the most gifted musicians. Members don't all have the same function. And then as we read in 1 Chronicles uh, 15, 22, Kenaniah led the singing because he was skillful at it. So again, we, we definitely want to um, you know, use the gifts and the talents uh, that we have in our church uh, body and, and, and use those who are most gifted in, in the worship setting that doesn't mean that we have to be flawless or perfect or professional musicians it just means that um, we should really be seeking to to leverage the best of of, of the talent that we have um, and then also have that a commitment um, to be to be growing in excellence and, and growing in our in our skill 
D, authentic worship. D.A. Carson put it like this. He says that uh, some who publicly lead the corporate meetings uh, of the people of God merely perform. Others are engrossed in the worship of God. Some merely sing. Some put on a great show of being involved, but others transparently worship God. So which of these describe you? Um, are you simply mouthing the lyrics? Do you uh, only pretend to be in, engaged, um, moving your hands, bowing your head at just the right moments in order to look worshipful? Or are you seeking to be a, uh, a transparent worshiper? Naturally, genuinely, uh, and obviously demonstrating a desire to exalt uh, Jesus Christ. If we want the church to be inspired by our leadership, we have to begin with an authentic example, godly lifestyle. The standard for leading worship is not sinless perfection, um, but there has to be a consistent uh, lifestyle of godliness. Areas of compromise uh, not only weaken our example, um, but really call into question whether we should be leading at all. And sometimes the best way that, that you can demonstrate the value of Jesus Christ to others is by stepping down. Um, you know, God, of course, God, God can use us, um, but he doesn't need us. And the world is, has seen enough leaders whose sin has dishonored the Savior and harmed the church. And we're called to set an example for the church with our conduct. We need to pursue every possible means available to do that. And so I would just encourage you, if you're watching, if you don't have people in your life that know you well and are helping you to live a life that is worthy of the gospel, find them. Um, temptation is too great. The sin is too deceptive and the world is too attractive to think that we can live an overcoming life on our own. Guiding principles. Do what God clearly commands. Don't do what God clearly forbids. Use scriptural wisdom for everything else. One example of scripture on how we can do this is found in 1 Corinthians 9, um, verses 19 through 23. It says this, it says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside of the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I might share with them in its blessings. So, in the world of missiology, um, I think missions, this is called contextualization. Okay, That is, that churches should be aware of the cultural context in which lost people around them live. Um, and they should make every effort to bring the love and the truth of Jesus in word and deed to be all things to all people using all means to save some. And to be clear, this is not uh, promoting some sort of a, a seeker-sensitive sense, uh, seeker approach to church where doctrine is downplayed. Um, instead, we, we do want to be seeker-sensible. And this just simply means that, that we don't stop using the words of the Bible, which are packed with theological meaning, uh, like sin, propitiation, wrath, judgment, hell. Um, but we should make every effort to explain those words. Um, it, it also winsomely defends against lost people's objections so that they understand what Christians believe and why. Um, while they are all invited to, they're invited to believe these things as well. And so uh, by contextualizing 
the, the, the church is not compromising, uh, but rather obeying the example of Paul who rebuked Peter for his sinful attempt to have church only for Jews that did not welcome Gentiles to their culture. Remember, the, the New Testament was written in Greek. That was the language of the street. We're reminded of the Reformation where you know, the, the, the Word of God was translated uh, into English or into the, the Word of the, the people, the spoken language, so that people had access. We don't want to be so lofty and so high-minded um, that you know, a lost person coming into uh, our, one of our church services it feels totally alienated and has no idea what's going on, what these words mean, why we're um, you know, singing songs and that, that, that haven't been defined. So, so we want to be conscious. That's not the, uh, the, the we, we don't do everything through um, you know, for, for the purpose of that lost person coming in. The church is a gathering of believers. But we certainly do want to be conscious and aware um, and not do things that uh, are going to unnecessarily cause confusion. So I hope that this video um, is helpful to you. Um, I hope that um, the, these, these concepts and these principles that we, we find in, in God's word related to music um, will uh, help, help stretch you and grow you in your thinking about music um, in this context at this time. Um, and uh, really look forward to uh, inviting you in to participating uh, with us uh, with the, the music ministry uh, at Calvary Baptist and uh, just excited to see all that God continues to do uh, in, and, in and through us here at, at the church.